Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of the Whitetail Apprentice series. As always, I'm your host, Josh Luck, and I am co-hosted by Jacob Sklinner and Christopher Leppert. Fellas, how you doing? What's up? Hey. Hey. Uh, so we are very excited about today's guest. We have on Dr. Bronson Strickland. Some of you might have heard of him on various podcasts, uh, but this is, a, this is a guest we've been wanting to have on for a while. Um, so without further ado, uh, Dr. Strickland, why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself for anyone that might not be familiar with you um, and just kind of give a quick background of your expertise, if you will. Yeah, sure thing. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, I am a, I'm at Mississippi State University. I'm a professor of wildlife management. I'm also the co-director of the MSU Deer Lab. And essentially what that means is we do deer research, uh, but we really try to focus on deer research that is meaningful to our state wildlife agency, the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks, as well as to land managers and hunters. So we make a very concerted effort to do research that we think is gonna be really useful to managers and to hunters and we try to make sure that we interpret scientific findings and get them out so people can digest them and apply them. And we do that through websites and publications and podcasts and videos. So that, that in short is, is what I do. Nice. How, how long have you been doing this? I have been, uh, golly, uh, in this specific position 18 years oh wow yeah quite some time and then your your close colleague uh his name is eluding me for some reason steve um, damaris steve damaris that is correct he is also a wealth of knowledge i've i've listened to the msu deer lab podcast for oh uh, i guess a couple of years now how, how long have you had that has it been three or four um if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm, you know, we're talking about my years of experience that that takes its toll <laughs> on your memory. Um, we started that either in 2017 or 2018. Okay, so longer than I'm thinking. Maybe I think I've just been listening to it the about three years now, on and off. Uh, some great information for any for anyone that's listening to us. I do highly recommend going over to the MSU Deer Lab podcast because there is some very good information on there. And you you guys have. Uh, some of your grad students are a wealth of knowledge too. Uh, was was Mariah Bogus one of your guys' grad students? Yes, and I completely yeah. agree. He was and still is a wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Yes, yes. He's been one that I talked to Chris about. I'm like, man, we should we should try and get Mariah Bogus on the podcast Absolutely. to talk about a few things. Yeah. So there's there's a bunch a bunch of good graduates come come out of your guys' school. He has a um, lot of uh, well, he was a deer coordinator for the state of Indiana, the deer biologist or deer coordinator for the state of Indiana for a couple of years. And yeah. uh, he also has a lot of good hunting experience from your neck of the woods. Hmm. So probably a lot of things you would have in common to talk about. Yeah, I, I really wanted to get him on and talk about, um, I don't know if his area of expertise was uh, ache, uh, different oaks. I feel like I remember hearing an episode where he was talking about different oaks and acorns and and stuff like that. He is Mr. Red Oak, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was good to know. I was he actually was out scouting. To know. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually out scouting today, and I was glassing up the different red oaks. They were there. Quite a few are holding acorns in in our area. I didn't find too many white oaks or even chinkapin oaks holding any. It's um, it's almost like worthless to even care about white oaks at this point. I'm convinced, even on the years where they are loaded, I they're hitting red oaks or well, a pin oak is a red oak, but they they smash pin oaks all the time, and pin oaks drop consistently. White oaks around here just they kind of suck. <laughs> yeah, they're very inconsistent. Uh, well, I don't want to get down too much of a rabbit hole, so. Let, let's go ahead and just kind of give the listeners an overview of what we plan on doing for this episode. Uh, so for everyone listening, uh, this is kind of kind of a transition point in the series. Uh, we're going to start with this episode and, and really cover kind of buck um, 
behavioral patterns, travel patterns, betting patterns, different things along those lines. And we're going to, we're going to try and do it chronologically throughout the season. And the idea for this episode is to give the listeners kind of a base knowledge of, of, okay, this, this is what the research says. And then the following episodes after, after this, we have, uh, we've done interviews with various hunters on various topics. So we'll, We'll have an episode coming out on bed hunting. We'll have an episode coming out with a hunter that's really good at identifying and utilizing scrapes and licking branches to, you know, to kill deer um, and, and various things like that. So the listeners will be able to go back to this episode and say, okay, here's what the research says. And then in the following episodes, they'll be like, okay, here's what the anecdotal uh, evidence from this experience hunter says. And you should be able to kind of go back and forth and say, here are the similarities here are the differences, and if there are differences, understand why there might be differences. So that way you can apply whatever tactics or skill sets or anything like that to your specific area. That is the hope of what we're doing here. Um, so before we get into things, we're going to throw out qu quite a bit of terminology. And Dr. Strickland, I would, if it's okay with you, I'd like to just hit on some of the terminology, kind of give brief definitions before we get into all that. So that way, when we start, you know, going down these rabbit holes, the listeners will have um, a, a good understanding. Um, so, Jacob, you had a list specifically that you would like to hit on real quick, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And a few just different things would be good for us to get down. There's more terminology that we're going to cover throughout this and we can kind of define it as we go. But I feel like it'd be easy for whoever has got their notepad out, which they probably should for this episode, to write down these definitions right now. So... Uh, the first one I kind of wanted to touch on that I often hear in studies reference is a betting bout. And when defining that, I wanted to, and I don't know if you're, you're I'm sure you are familiar with this, but um, specifically how long are they betted in a betting bout? Um, this, this is really, really early in the episode to go ahead and say it depends, but yeah. it, <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of variation with that um uh, let's go i guess with, what was your what was your threshold like like um I, I believe i was listening to a podcast that said it was around like it'd have to be stationary for an hour and a half or an hour or something like that okay so you're asking what criteria did we use to classify yes. a betting bout gotcha exactly <laughs> exactly so um a little bit about the data to do that so data is from gps collars and our callers were programmed to give us a location every 15 minutes. So the way we defined a betting bout would be if we had four consecutive locations um, within some defined period or some defined area. And you, you might be saying, well, my gosh, you've got a GPS caller. Why can't you tell us at the exact location and that is because these locations come from triangulation of satellites. So there's error associated with that. And the error can increase when you have tree canopy coverage. So we use the collar error rate for that particular area. And it's, it's about 30 yards, give or take. But when we had four consecutive every 15 minutes, so for an hour, when there was no deviation of a point going outside of that circle of error, we classified that as a as a betting bout. Now, we we all know the these data sets are really, really large. And and the reason I say that is we can't just examine every deer every day and look at the points and circle it and go, ah, he was bedded right there. You got to do this with code, with computer code to go through yeah. all this type of stuff. So there is no doubt in my mind that we had some instances, but it's probably far less than 1% of the time where a deer could have been standing up and moving around very slowly. And we classified it as bedding when it was not. But again, the majority of the time we feel real good with the way we classified it there. Yeah. And I would say for hunter's purposes, um, a deer within a 30 yard circle should be within the range if you're targeting it at that bed. I don't think, I mean, obviously sometimes five yards is the difference between you killing one and not, but I would say for the purpose of someone seeking to target a deer in a bed, uh, yeah. 30 yards 
based on where you're going to set up is is somewhat moot. Um, but uh, further on that, with 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 definitions, um, I've heard the term used in your studies, bedding area, and so that may be beds within a certain range of each other. How do you guys define from again? Uh, your your data standpoint, what would suffice as a bedding area? Yeah, if, if I remember correctly, that was within 100 yards. I think you're so right. That yeah. particular area, you could have several sites that be, would be within, within 100 yards of each other that we would say that was a particular discrete bedding area for that buck. So when I picture this, um, I wonder if you could have a bed and then he's moving linearly east 100 yards and then linearly east 100 yards and then is there any limit to how far that from end to end point could be or is it all within a 100 yard radius of say this center bed um yeah that that is a good question um i do not think there would be any limit i think the limit would be based on the start and stop time for the time period that we evaluated counting the number of beds. I see. I see. Okay. All right. Perfect. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and then uh, another term that we touched on just before this episode that uh, I think is, is important for our listeners to know um, is fidelity. So mm -hmm. when yep. you're, I, I was going to ask about that too. It's a good one. There. <laughs> good, good. Um, and and from what i understand you described that a little bit as the frequency of revisiting beds or or like a loyalty metric um could you could you go a little bit further in what you mean when you reference fidelity in these studies yeah so uh fidelity i guess very generally just means uh an affinity towards a site so a buck could have a lot of fidelity for a particular food plot it could also have a lot of fidelity for a particular bedding area, uh, but it essentially, if 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 a buck is showing greater fidelity to a spot, it just means he is coming back to that particular location more often. Okay. So, so there's not just a discrete site fidelity or not. It's it's a it's a range or a continuum of you are more or less, you know, showing fidelity. Gotcha. All right. Perfect. Um, there's a few other things I'm sure that we'll run along to that we'll, we'll have defined as we go. But I think those are very important things for us to understand as a deer hunter, uh, those concepts and how they associate to our hunting strategy. Josh, did you have anything else or Chris? Yeah, th those were the big ones um, that I had. And Chris, you didn't have anything? No. Okay. I'm sure we'll get into some other ones later. And then as they pop up, we'll just kind of define them as, as we go along. Um, so now that we have that covered and, and kind of got a good idea of what some of the terminology means, uh, I guess we'll get into the meat and potatoes of things. So we're going to start with early season. And, and Dr. Strickland, I'll kind of have you define early season for some of the studies or general research that you guys have done. Um, but in general, according to some of the research that you've done, as far as early season goes, as far as buck movement or buck behaviors what, what do you guys see is this like a general bed to food pattern uh, bedding how might that vary in the early season compared to other parts of the season can you kind of give us an overview of that yeah um re regarding the relationship with bedding uh i don't think there is a tremendous amount of variation that is that is going to change throughout the year uh, just meaning, so, so Josh, to answer your question, yeah, I mean, it, it's still going to be about food. Uh, this mm -hmm. is pre-rut, you know, this is way before rut. Um, and I guess I like to think about the, the, the annual cycle like this, is we have this very distinct period during summertime. And that is, you know, bucks are friendly to each other. They're, they're that way because they have very little testosterone in their system. And the decrease of testosterone is what triggers antler growth. When we see the increase in testosterone, that is when the mineralization is going to happen. That is when the hardening is going to occur, the antlers, and that is when the, the velvet shedding occurs. 
And that is when they become a different beast. And so that is when uh, bachelor groups are going to break up. And that is when, when some, but not all, are going to then have a very different home range than they had during the summertime. So the, the summer range versus the fall. Primarily, I don't think they're that much different at that point, meaning there's typically not going to be this big fall home range versus a uh, winter home range, et cetera. The big shift is going to occur after the bachelor groups break up. And so that that's just kind of the, the part of their annual cycle. At, at that point, there's still going to be social dynamics. It's going to be them figuring out who's uh, who's the big dog and who's not. Um, and, and then, of course, after that, they're going to shift from filling up their rumen to reproduction. So that, that's really when we see the other big change, of course, is, is going to be during the rut. So, and uh, you do do a great job in these studies of actually breaking down specifically rather than just saying like blanket statement early season pre-rut peak rut etc you actually break it down by month and by time period as well and as some hunters may notice as they look through some of these studies and we'll be sure to link your website and uh, a lot of your publications on there but they'll notice that your peak rut looks like it happens in december so with that that might be different than some of the areas that these the listeners uh, have in their, in their experience. Could you qualify where these studies are happening and over the time period and um, at least the ones that we are going to reference today, uh, what you are, we'll, we'll call it quarry, but but what you, with the deer you tagged, could you qualify what they are as far as age structure and things like that? So the, uh, the the study that we're, we're talking about here with the, the bucks that were GPS collared, that occurred in central Mississippi. Um, geographically, it would be east of our Delta region. You know, Delta region gets a lot of fame associated with that. It's our agricultural region. It's where our biggest bucks are harvested. It's our farm country. This was a little bit east of that. Uh, it's called the, the Big Black River Corridor. And it's kind of an ideal mix of uh, a little bit of topography, but but not a lot, but an ideal mix of diversity of different forest types, meaning upland pine, upland hardwood, bottomland hardwood. And, and to me, the ideal interspersion of agriculture. And so uh, think rather than Iowa, maybe think more Wisconsin from a Google Earth kind of look. You know, it's not just horizon to horizon agriculture, but the landscape is very punctuated and, and interspersed with agriculture. So in terms of a landscape where you can grow a very big deer population numbers wise, you can do that but then also really good habitat in the form of a lot of agriculture, a sufficient level of agriculture to also grow really big bucks. So that, that, that it's just a really good area of, of Mississippi for managing deer and harvesting deer. Um, what else did you ask? This occurred when, it, several years ago, I believe our bucks were on the hoof with GPS collars during 2017 and 2018 and then as we talked before we started recording it, it you, you end up with a study like this with well over 1 million different records and so it okay. takes a while to, to <laughs> through this, this type of stuff um age structure of of course our target you know i i wish we were in south texas sometimes and what I mean by that is um, in South Texas, my colleagues down there, they can capture more bucks with a helicopter in one weekend than we can do in three months. So wow. We have to capture them individually. It's almost like bow hunting. And so, you know, there will be a, a, a baited site with a dart gun. Sometimes we'll have a drop net, but it, it is a very slow process for us to capture. Our goal was uh, we wanted only, you know, four and a half plus year old bucks. 
But the reality sets in, and when you're on month three or month four or month five of trying to capture bucks, you know, you got to get this done. And so mm -hmm. we we did collar a couple two year olds, uh, but ninety percent of the the observations, the data come from a three and a half plus and about 30 percent of the bucks are five and a half plus so we have a good mix we really don't have any young bucks again 10 percent uh most of it is three and a half plus and a third of that is five and a half plus so that's the age structure that's a very very well represented age structure um yeah. now this is something that's really really hard to quantify anywhere you go but um, I'm assuming this occurred over areas with public land and or, all, no, private no, land. It didn't. all private land. Okay. All private land. How would you, and I know you guys do some uh, demographics on hunter effort and things like that. Um, how would you classify the pressure in this area? And I don't, everyone will just say like high or low or medium or whatever. They'll say what they, they think the pressure is. Are there any kind of quick, metrics you could you could give us as in um how frequently this area was hunted um i could but i can't here and <laughs> what i mean by that is we um we had a sample for this study not only were we looking at deer behavior of course with the gps collars but we wanted to also look at the interaction of hunting so we were not able to document every single time someone hunted this is all based on volunteers and cooperation but we were able to keep a record i would say for most of the hunting and so the way we would enumerate that over time is from the kind of the self-reporting we could determine what days were relatively high we had a lot of hunting pressure this day versus the days that were relatively low Putting it within the context, I'm sorry, but I, I can only make a high, medium, low comparison. That's I okay. would say relative to a wildlife management area or a state land or refuge that's hunted hard, I would say if that, if that were a 10, if hunting pressure were a 10, I would put on this area uh, a four. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, mu that's much better than just saying high or low. That's that's yeah. great, yeah. And and it, it's very hard to, to quantify because as, I've moved to different areas and I'm sure Josh and Chris and, and you, Dr. Strickland as well, have seen that there's an intelligence to certain hunting pressure in certain regions. And that is a factor that is not captured with sheer numbers. I think that, I, yes, there's success of hunters, but there are lots of hunters that seem to key in on certain things a lot more than others too. So I would say there's areas that I fear three cars in a parking lot a lot more than I fear 10. Um, yeah. and it's usually because I know what those plates mean <laughs> and I know who's in there. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I've hogged the stage enough. Um, I, I really like that you're able to quantify a lot of that stuff for us. Um, there's one more question I was going to ask, but I can't think of it right now. So if Josh, I'm sure you have another one in here. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and go back to what you were saying earlier, Dr. Strickland, when you're talking about, when, when you get that velvet coming off and you have start having these shifts where the bucks will go from their summer range to like their fall range. Um, I've, I've heard some different things on, on podcasts. They're not coming to me now, but I, I, I believe I've heard you talk about like a percentage, like some, some bucks will kind of stay, some bucks will shift. So as far as like a percentage is when, cause a lot of people around here just assume like all like almost all the deer will shift away and do a fall pattern like how how accurate is that is there like a percentage you can give yeah so um I, i'm not saying this is the perfect or ideal nomenclature it it was just the only thing we could come up with at the time was what's kind of a name to separate and we came up with uh what we called mobile mobile box mobile personalities versus sedentary so sedentary would have a great deal of sight fidelity compared to a mobile buck but that that percentage josh was 30 percent from our sample 30 percent okay. of the bucks demonstrated what we would call a there we go a, a mobile personality 
And I think this is going to help set us apart a little bit at times is I'm going to try to show a little bit of these graphics from your study as we go on. So this is a graphic yeah. above of a mobile buck and a sedentary buck. That there, that that's perfect. That's perfect. And so how did we differentiate, you know, when we're, we're talking earlier about you kind of have to write code to, to analyze all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Essentially a mobile buck is going to have two separate non overlapping home ranges, M meaning zero, zero overlap with, you know, part of the year for half the year and the other half of the year, they, they are completely different and separate versus what you see at the bottom of the screen there, a sedentary buck kind of follows that conventional wisdom that we always think of. Now that particular buck, buck number 13, that is not to say that buck used all parts of his home range evenly throughout the year. He definitely favored different parts of that, but there was never a point in time to where area he was using was completely distinct and different than another. And so we had some of these, what we termed mobile bucks might be separated by a mile. Some of them were separated by uh, 10 plus miles. And then the, the buck that got really famous uh, several years ago was the buck that would spend his fall and winter in Mississippi and spend his summer in Louisiana. And so he would swim the Mississippi River in February, spend the summer, and then August he would come back to Mississippi and he did that two years in a row. So that wasn't just a, a one-off. I mean, he had a pattern not only of making that trek, but even the timing of when he left and returned was remarkably similar. Wow. That What's a um, swim? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah wow. What's the thought behind like why these mobile bucks? Why why do they shift? Is it is it in correlation to like you know, rut, like they have found a doe group that tends to come in at a certain time. That's just what they prefer. Or is there any thought behind that? Uh, you know, th there's a lot of thoughts, I guess, Josh, but th there is nothing that we can, that we have felt like we could even test, much less prove from the, the data that we have. The, the knee jerk response is usually, well, the, the summer food must have been better over in Louisiana. I, that's a very good hypothesis. Unfortunately, the data show that his fall and winter home range had just as many soybeans as the place he summered in Louisiana. So it wasn't moving because of food quality. And if the food quality was so poor in that area, why didn't these other bucks move away as well? But they, they stayed right at home. There's been some hypotheses regarding, well, who knows, maybe that buck was born there. Maybe his natal range was in Louisiana. And for whatever reason, that time of year, he goes back there. But we, we re really don't know. We, we've also thought that maybe there is always a proportion of all wildlife populations that engage in a, in a process because birds will do this called prospecting, meaning that uh, certain individuals, the grass is always greener. And they're always going to take a risk like human beings did hundreds of years ago being an explorer. You know, that, that was a really, really big risk to be an explorer. But if things came out good, they came out really, really good for you. Um, you, you may also die at sea or may, you may also die where, wherever you explore to. So sometimes we just wonder if that is just part of the evolution of a whitetail or a species or others, that there's always some individuals that are going to be explorers and they're going to be colonizers. And if they go and the grass is greener, they'll stay there. Now, but Josh, other than that, we, we, we don't know. With that particular buck, do, did he get killed did he die of old age what what happened there because i noticed you said he swam across the river two years and then there was nothing left so can you kind of give us some insight on what happened sure thing so so two things happened and credit all the credit to the the hunting club where he resided uh during that fall and winter when he was four and a half because he could have been killed and uh, luckily, they, they saw the collar and participated and kind of were intrigued by the story of this buck. And so 
he was not harvested and again did the exact same process but that following hunting season his, the time was up on his collar we could only get about two years of life out of their collar okay. so uh he, so he was harvested that fall okay how how big did he end up being um a little above average re respectable um i don't know the exact boone and crockett score but if my memory uh, i would probably say mid to high 130s solid buck yeah solid buck yeah 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 especially, especially for central mississippi especially <laughs> in the mississippi louisiana although i'm i'm still holding out i see lots of big deer from almost every state in the south so well, <laughs> that's still, Luke, that's a good deer anywhere really I, yeah. I believe i heard from luke reese up that he said he would put this uh the uh, black river corridor up against any other area in, in any other area in the u.s um yeah in terms of boone and crockett bucks produced uh, which is extremely high praise um yeah but he, he talked sure. a lot about the biodiversity just as you two have um I'm assuming that the acreage covered or the miles covered was purely dependent on the bucks that were how far they traveled, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, man, there's only about 3 billion questions I'd love to ask you. Um, so, um, uh, but before gosh, we, ahead. we get on a little further, I just wanted to, so this, this, just to help the listeners out and it might vary because you're a little bit further south than than we are but this the time where you start seeing the shift uh for you guys down and where the study was taken when about when during the year did this take place um well for, for the the buck i was just referring to that began in uh in february is when he would start staging on the mississippi side of the river and then go to louisiana so february was the month he went from mississippi to louisiana and august was the month he went from louisiana to mississippi um there were some of the other mobile bucks also i i cannot say that is always going to be the pattern that it's always going to be august but um, I would say generally in that time frame, though, fall. Why don't we call it fall and spring? Okay. All right. I was just, I was just curious. We, whenever we see um, those bucks start shifting, it, it's typically in that uh, late August, like September-ish time frame, kind of all throughout the month of September around here. I would say uh, we did an episode a while back on beating the shift. Um, just different tactics we found or kind of things to hone in on so you don't get as many mobile bucks. Um, it was really nice because I think after we did that, I heard you on a podcast. I don't remember which one and you were you were talking about the sedentary and versus like the mobile bucks. And uh, it was just really interesting because you said 30 percent would be mobile. So that means, you know, 70 percent would have to be sedentary. And that's essentially what we were trying to convey on on that podcast with what we've seen and, and utilized is uh me for example I, I tend to hone in on areas with uh lots of diversity as far and like as far as food you may have like ag and it's been there's been some sort of cut maybe a select cut different oaks kind of everything a deer would need in one area um and with it being public it also for me to quantify it it, it has to have areas where deer can go and escape pressure they don't have to go far but they can easily escape pressure so i have found more of those sedentary bucks in areas like that over the past few years so um it was just very interesting how it kind of matched with with what you were talking about well what if i, I may just for another minute or so <clears throat> it, to me it was it was really interesting so i, I give all the credit here to hunters that are very very diligent with their trail camera data because way before way before we did this study 10 plus years before you know when, pe when people really get into trail cameras and then studying in the inventory i, I would get this question every single year of I, I need this explanation uh the question would be something like 
I, I see this particular buck, you know, every day or every other day until November 2nd. And for the past three years, that week, that first week in November, that buck vanishes. And they go on to say, I assume it was killed because I got it so consistently and then it was gone. And then the next year they see it again. And then that first week in November, it's gone. Simultaneously, it might be the other side of that of we never, ever see this buck. We never see it during the summertime. We don't know anything about it. And the first week of December, it shows up every single year. I did not take that very seriously before we did this study. And we started seeing these mobile bucks and how they have a pretty reliable calendar of when they do this home range shift. Um, it, it, it's, it's pretty reliable year after year. Now, we only have two years of data. I wish we had 10 years of you know, all these bucks collared. Um, but that was what, what I saw was enough to go, yep, all those people that had that camera data that were saying that buck was either gone on this week or would always show up on this week, this, that's what's happening. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've talked to many guys about that. It's, uh, who were we talking with recently, Sklinner? Uh, we were talking with Shane Parker about this because he's, mm -hmm. he's a guy that lives in the South. I don't know if you've, you've, you've heard of him, Dr. Strickland, but he, he runs, I want to say somewhere between two to 300 cameras. He's done some like research studies with some local people and, and has just poured through the data and stuff. And they, he talked about the same thing. You would, you know, years in a row, you get a buck that show up in a certain area at a certain time of the year and how it was just very repeatable and how we've talked to other hunters that would kind of use that to kind of recognize it and then use it to, you know, capitalize on, on how to kill like maybe a specific buck or a quote unquote target buck. Um, and we'll, we'll have an episode on that kind of later in this series. It's just, it's just really fascinating how you can, can utilize that. Now, a lot of times we, uh, I correlate it to, um, cause in my area, I see it more often kind of in that late October, November timeframe. So I usually correlate it to, uh, maybe a does coming in early or some of those, you know, first does coming in the cycle, um, and just bucks kind of keying off on that or, or, you know, you get those, uh, fawns that come in late and then you'll get some bucks that move in. It just seems that they're very familiar with that. That that's what I usually related to. Yeah. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Okay. So getting back to early season, cause we're going to start to dive in here. Um, so the October low, let's just go straight into it. Um, I know what you're so I know what your studies say on it, but what do you see in correlation to now? We'll call it the month before rut. Well, the month before peak rut low. So it, it, in my neck of the woods, that would be the November lull, mm -hmm. the, the month before where a majority of the rut takes place. <clears throat> you know, um, I, I say this with, with all due respect because there are so many, so many credentialed, highly credentialed hunters who uh, just swear that, you know, something is going on with this lull. And all I can say is that with our data, things may be different in Ohio. They may be different in Wisconsin or Iowa, you know, so, so be it. But with our data, the month before the rut, we do not see any distinguishable difference compared to the month before the lull month. So in our case, let's say the rut is in December. November is not that hardly any different at all from October. Now there is a huge difference when we get to December, the rut. But when we compare rut minus a month, the, the quote lull month, <coughs> and go another month back for us again, October, there may be a difference in the way that you are quote, measuring deer movement, like it very well could be if I am measuring deer movement by my camera data, there very well could be a shift in where the deer are moving and therefore you're not getting the frequency of photos, which would lead you to draw, come to the conclusion that they're just not moving. I, I am just entirely 
opposed to that for number one, I'll say this uh, from the perspective of, well, we just don't see that with our data at all. Number two, it's like uh, a deer is still going to eat. I mean, it's not like, hey, this is law month and we're just going to kick back and bed down for two thirds of the day. I mean, they're going to still be a deer every single day. So to me, the only way we can kind of reconcile what people are seeing in this long held law belief is maybe there has been some type of subtle shift. If we're going to use October as that benchmark, there's a difference between September and October and where the deer are, but it's not that they're moving less in October or I in my agree. November. 100%. I, I feel like here, our situation is basically, you know, a lot of these deer have been in velvet all summer. They shed velvet, pressure enters the woods, food changes, and there's so much going on at one time. And now these deer that we've seen out in fields and, you know, all that all summer long, they've not been pressured. They've been on camera every day and we're stupid enough to think they're going to do that during season. And then all of a sudden you have deer that are bedding a little tighter and, and they're bedded super close to all these oaks that are dropping and everything. And here, what I would say the difference is, you know, from the South is I feel like our deer have to really prepare for a winter to make it through, especially as you get farther North. So they're really keyed in on those food sources a lot of times that are, you know, in that thicker timber and everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I feel like the October law is the best time to hunt deer because when you're on them, you're on them, you know, you're, you're in close. But anyway, just to kind of throw that out there, you feel free to give your thoughts on that, Dr. Strickland. Well, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm just going to add in one more caveat for why we might have bucks moving in different locations is the October law. Correct me if I'm wrong, where y'all are at. Uh, October also signifies hunting season. Yes. And so now we have hunter effort. And so now we have disturbance. So, so now people are in, the, are in the woods. And so we have these triggers for deer that, hey, it's that time of year again. I'm now smelling humans. I'm now bumping into them in the woods. And so their their patterns change. So I believe this would be a really good way to kind of orient this podcast is there's a lot of stuff that we know from the data of your studies. And I hate, hate going by anecdotes to explain what happened, where someone will say, this is the data. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, well, the one time that I did this, it was the opposite. Or the one time I did this, it was the same. You know, that that is not proof of a fact, but it is an experience and it, and it helps in our minds validate it. So I, I do like, however, this theorizing about what is impacting the movement or what is potentially making the data go away from the example that a lot of people see. And so while a lot of people, as you pointed out, hunting season starting, um, I would say that there's a mid-September looking kind of lull in Wisconsin or late September lull in Wisconsin. Typically, they're referring to a week-long period um, rather than the whole month. But I feel as though that this would be a, a nice way to orient it where you give the data on what you're truthfully seeing. And I that was the exact point that you just touched on is that a lot of people do check their cameras because they get really excited at the beginning of the season. They do hunt around their cameras and they do hunt and so their hunter observation will be lower if they're hunting in the same areas repeatedly their cameras will have less activity if they're approaching their cameras and leaving their scent around those cameras especially if they're hunting on their cameras so i feel like the way you combat the lull is not to be habitual and to go in analyzing sign of what the deer are actually doing and adjust to those situations um i think you hit the nail on the head Thank you. You have an excellent graphic, actually, in your study. Um, let me see if I can find it really quick. Yeah. But you, you I believe it is, yeah, I believe it is a theory. I think it says theoretical in the caption, um, but I'm going to share it anyways. Uh, you show how stands not hunted being in these boxes right here, these orange or yellow boxes. And this is a normal deer's range. And then this may be how the deer adjusts its range due to that pressure. And I think this is 
while you do say a theoretical example, I think this is fairly accurate because you see the deer doing things like potentially moving downwind of these beforehand or as it encounters them, making a change in its direction. And I think this is fairly realistic for, for what I've seen at least, again, anecdotally in my hunting experience. I, I would agree there. And I know Chris has experienced this before, but Dr. Strickland, have you, I know this says stands, stands hunted. Um, have you done this with like trail cameras at all? So like known trail camera placements and like how often people are going to go check the cameras and then how those bucks might maneuver around the cameras? Um, we have not, but, um, I will talk about uh, an Auburn Auburn University study led by Steve Ditchkoff that that I thought could speak to this as well, as well as a, a study from Oklahoma that Steve Damaris and others led. First, the, the Auburn study was looking at and and forgive me, I don't remember all the details of the methods, but the the take home point was they had bucks collared where they were knowing what their their pat their movement patterns were and they were able to document these stands where people hunted and then basically demonstrated that for i believe up to four to five days post hunting that that buck would kind of show an aversion to that point in space where the hunter was so there was kind of like a multi-day footprint, you know, a short-term legacy of a hunter was there, the deer could detect it, and the buck would stay away from that several days after until, whether it be from the buck's memory or whether it be from scent dissolving, dissipating, you know, who knows. But then it would kind of resume back to being within range uh, of that particular stand. With this Another aversion, way. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, I interrupted you. You continue. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted the last part there. Okay, well, I was going to let you click. Go ahead and, and interrupt oh, me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, um, this aversion would this aversion occur after after going on his access trail, let's say, or actually encountering somewhere that he left scent, or would this aversion occur without necessarily going to that stand if i remember correctly and this is a number of years ago but i think they the way they measured that was they knew day by day points on the landscape where someone hunted and they had day by day movement patterns of all these bucks throughout the hunting season and they could line up pretty well to where there was a hunter at this spot and even though the day before, two days before, or 10 days before, that buck had a pattern of being in and around that stand, once that hunting event occurred, the buck stayed away from that stand for, I believe it was four to five days. And, and I'm sure you can look that up. I, I, I'm sure I do not have all the details right, but uh, I, I thought that was very interesting. Um, similarly, Steve was part of a project in Oklahoma, and this was a really, really big private property where they could manipulate who got to hunt where. And so a true treatment control type deal. And so they had two years so they could, they could uh, Josh, they could randomize every year where the treatment occurred and where the control was and so forth. And so they had to control no hunting they had a treatment of high hunting pressure and a treatment of low hunting pressure. So think like if you're signing up for a WMA hunt and when you got notification that you were drawn, uh, it was either, you know, tough, you know, nobody hunts in this area or you are assigned to the high hunting area where there's a bunch of other hunters or the low hunting pressure area. And what they determined in that high hunting pressure area is that it would take about three to four days for bucks to respond and they were still moving if you looked at like the total distance that they moved that that really didn't change but how they navigated the landscape differed a lot meaning they were not taking what we would say these long and linear step lengths 
So they were not, you know, point A to point B to point B. They were not exposing themselves after a couple of days. Once they seeing, smelling, hearing humans in the area, their paths became uh, more tortuous is the, the term, but more complicated. So a lot more zigzagging. So still moving, still foraging, still navigating the landscape, but not covering as much ground and not exposing themselves as much. So deer can pattern us pretty well too. Yes, I, that, I agree with that quite a bit. Um, it was, I, I think you mentioned some of this on the Southern Outdoorsman podcast, uh, might've been a month or so ago now. And it got me thinking two years ago, I, I harvested a buck in September, uh, basically using what you had just talked about. I was using hunting pressure um, to kind of help narrow down up, up where I thought this buck was, was going to be most vulnerable in daylight. So uh, in 2022, Chris and I, and some other guys, we went and hunted Nebraska. So we missed Kentucky's opener. I didn't get to hunt uh, Kentucky until like that second week. And on this particular WMA, I had postseason scouted quite a bit. I had some cameras in the area. Um, and then there was this one, there was a couple bucks in the area that I was after, but I, I knew one of them had a high fidelity for this, this one ridge. Um, I would catch them on camera kind of all around it. And actually in August before the season, I actually bumped him from a bed. Um, so I, I knew he, the area he liked to be around. Um, and those first two weeks, when, when I got back from Nebraska, I could tell there had been lots of hunting pressure. There was where I had scouted and there was kind of tall grass in order to, to walk these fields. Like it was like a beat down walking path. So I, I knew, it's like, man, this place got pressure pretty hard. You could look at the harvest results. There were five bucks taken off this piece and it wasn't very big. So I'm like, man, this, lots of people came here. Uh, so my thought process the the day I, I took the buck it was only my second set of the season uh, on this piece but my thought was okay more than likely all the pressure is probably happening on the weekend and not too many people like to hunt the mornings they usually hunt evenings so highest pressure being you know on the weekends in the evenings like when when my, my thought process was when do i think i'm going to catch this buck you know, kind of off guard. When do I think he'll kind of be comfortable moving in um, near that ridge in daylight? So I went on Thursday um, in the morning, and sure enough, I killed I killed one of my target bucks at seven thirty in the morning. Um, he wasn't like out in the open. He was in this uh, on top of the ridge that had been cut, and it was several years like grown up. So like some of the native grasses were over my head, and I'm six foot tall. Um, but I caught him slipping through this bedding area what i was quoting a bedding area and it just so happened to work out but that kind of aligns with what what you were just talking about yeah and uh you know earlier um jacob i think you were talking about hunting pressure um and so you know we would count up days you know it's either a, a high a medium or a low hunting pressure day this is not a trick question what, what do y'all think were the high hunting pressure days Weekends. Saturday. Weekends. Saturday. <laughs> Absolutely. So if you combine that with what we were talking about with the Auburn study and Josh, just what you were saying before you said it, I was like, I'd go on Thursday. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think oh, you yeah. literally mentioned that in your interview. I did. Um, uh, so for anyone that wants to watch that hunt, it is on our YouTube channel. Um, um, so people can watch it. And I, yeah, in my interview when I'm in the tree, I, I literally mentioned that. I figured I'd come in on a Thursday in the morning and try and make something happen. And I wasn't sitting very long. I was sitting for maybe 30 minutes. It was um, a hell of a pack out. Yeah. Um, so, but, sorry, Jacob. I wanted to go, go back ahead, to, to one thing um, where, where we had gotten into the quote unquote lull period. Um, I believe I've read in some places where it, where it talks about and and this could be wrong so i would like for you to clarify dr strickland where it talks about i'm trying to think of how i want to word this uh, i believe i read and I, I can't remember where it was but buck uh bucks tend to move 
as, as you get further in the year, they'll move more and more. And I don't remember if it's like distance wise or if it's just more movement during daylight as the year progresses. So, and I've, I've, I've heard some, some rebuttals to the, to the quote unquote October law in our area that that's a myth because like the data shows that these bucks are actually moving more in daylight. Um, is, is that accurate? Um, well, with our data, that would be accurate only during the rut period. And I would give that, uh, a, rather than just having two weeks, I'd give that over about a month. Okay. Yeah. So go to, yeah, go to figure Sweet. five. There you go. Yeah. Here we are. That's what we're looking so for. Total distance. And what is that? Hourly? Yeah. Hourly distance traveled. Okay. And so you can see it really gets you until the pre-rut. And during the pre-rut, that is when you see more movement, period. I mean, they're just covering more ground, period, in daytime as well as nighttime. But if you look at hourly movement rate, the rut, that is when they are moving more during the day. They have an elevated pattern of moving during the day during the rut. Gotcha. For, for our listeners, we, we um, I do recommend going over to the YouTube and, and looking at this because we are pulling up the um, buck movement study uh, that was published by by the Mississippi Deer Lab here. Um, if, if you don't get on our YouTube, you can find it on their website too, but it is on page seven that we're looking at here. Okay. So that, along with ahead. movement in different times of the year, uh, I was wondering about uh, fidelity in relation to different times of the year. And I don't think, I'm, I'm sure this has been discussed because you've done a lot of different things, but I, I don't hear it quite as often as I hear some of the other things. Uh, is there a relationship between a buck's fidelity with betting and the time of year that he's betting there? I, I do not think uh, Luke Resop may be angry with me that i'm not remembering this <laughs> he means like I, I crunched those numbers and told you the answer but um <laughs> I, i'm i'm not recalling that um what i guess information i'm drawn to jacob thinking about that question is that that a buck if if you look at a home range and you know that that home range is one word you can define a lot of different ways yeah there's an annual home range and then there's seasonal home range and there's a weekly home range. well if you look at a daily uh mm -hmm. which that, that's in the publication we got this daily home range uh they're they're covering about 200 acres per day and of, out of all the stuff where we talk about things changing so much during the rut the daily home range is not changing what is changing is the distance or the net displacement between daily home range on day one and daily home range on day two and daily home range on day three so that really means during the rut that those bedding sites are further and further apart they they have to be during the rut <laughs> So maybe, Jacob, the way to say is they're probably going to show the greatest fidelity outside of the rut and all bets are off during the rut. I got you. Um, in, in relation to this, and I know we were talking about, I think this might be what you're referring to, Dr. Strickland, is um, this is a, the, the, I, I know there's stuff with buck annual home range size, but I think these graphics are very, very enlightening as a hunter uh, showing the time spent in behaviors by the time of day. So basically we're seeing right now, and again, you can see this on, a, on the YouTube, how long a buck spends bedded, feeding or tracking and walking. Those are the three major behaviors, bedding, feeding, walking. Uh, we're, we're seeing how much that buck travels um, and uses those modes of travel by the month. So basically by rut phase. We're seeing that by the time of day, so when they're most often walking, feeding, or bedded during the day, and behaviors by rut phase and, and 
month. And there's also an annual home range size of an adult buck as well, shown in these graphics that we're looking at right now. Um, and hey, and there, there's your answer to y'all's October or our November lull. Yes. If you look at figure 13 and compare October to November for the bottom behavior, the, the moving or walking, they're on their feet just as much those two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's these are really good graphics for the listeners. They're they're good to compare here. Gives you a nice visual of movement throughout the throughout the season and throughout the day because you got the figure 12 there where it talks about dawn, day, dusk, and nighttime movement. Those are really interesting. See, now yeah. I want to tell people like, look, you just you have just about the same percentage of killing a deer in the morning as you do in the evening. That's Chris is very smiling because <laughs> Chris is smiling because I prefer morning hunting over evening hunting. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna whip this figure out and be like, look, see, it says right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, sorry, Jacob, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. That's an excellent point too, because you can see that uh dawn and dark are you know, dark is maybe one percentage point higher, but they spend about the same amount of time during dawn and dark, which would be sunrise, sunset, uh, walking. Um, so that's very interesting. And, and we talked a little bit about uh, fidelity and in reference to time of year. Uh, I'm interested, and I know this is probably very hard data to extrapolate because this is coming from a, a location on a map. So it might be very hard to put this into code per se. But do you see deer having any sort of habitual repetition from their range during the summer in the preseason as you do during the rut? And so, for instance, what this may look like on a GPS study is a buck doing a visit to, let's say, during the rut, he's motivated by different bedding areas, right? Um, maybe this buck during the summer walks that route or spends a couple days in each of those areas and then replicates that during the rut. Do you ever see that happen? And I know that may be very, very, very hard for you to, to see in a map because you'd be have to looking at hundreds of deer and, and checking that. I, I don't know if this speaks exactly to what you're referring to, but my head is turned here because I got another screen with that publication up. I'm trying to find the figure no worries to draw your attention to give me just a sec okay so that would be figure number nine okay i'll scroll to it figure nine okay i will share that really quick and uh i don't think this perfectly jacob answers mm -hmm. your question but it may provide a little bit of insight is looking at that total distance versus net distance and mm -hmm. the whole deal with with net distance is also called net displacement is that is the difference between whatever hour of the day you pick i believe we picked midnight but so total daily distance is precisely what you think it is it is the total, the sum of all the distances the buck did in that 24 hour period. The net distance is the difference between where he was at at midnight on day one and where he was at at midnight at day two. And so we see that that increases over time with the rut. So we're going from on the average in October, November, they're about 450 yards apart. So that's daily net displacement. But when we get into the peak and, and into the, the rut, that gets up to 700 yards mm. apart. So I, I guess, Jacob, the way to say that, I can't give you exactly what that would be, but they are demonstrating a lot more fidelity in October and November as compared to during the rut. I gotcha. Yeah, that, that makes sense. very interesting it would be interesting yeah it would be interesting to I'd probably it would be very difficult to do but correlating those um 
that quote unquote <laughs> fidelity like in the in the rut time frame if it if it kind of correlates with does coming into heat like mm -hmm. you know because they only spend what like three four days with the doe breeding her and then they move on and then find another doe and so i'd be i'd be curious mm -hmm. is I'd, well maybe i should ask this do you ever see well i guess jacob you were just asking this as far as any type of pattern like a yearly pattern like uh, like let's say buck a although he's moving quite a bit he tends to hit these same areas during that rut time frame and then the next year he, he does the same thing do that's you, a little do you different. see that at all um so a, a couple things and and both of these i'm, I'm gonna wiggle out of it a little bit uh but th those are very good questions uh the, the way luke and i and others phrase that with like betting is <clears throat> When you do have an, an area where a buck is showing some fidelity, some bedding, is uh, we call that circuit time. So in terms of running a circuit and coming back, you know, you've closed the loop and you've come back to that mm -hmm. same spot. Now here, uh, I'm fuzzy. I want to say on average, when they did demonstrate coming back to the same bedding area, I think that was every two days. I believe that was every two days. The other analysis, this would not be within the year. This would be a year to year fidelity is Natasha. If you're not familiar with her, you you will be in the future. She is a, uh, a mathematician that is working with the deer lab now, and she is upped our analytical game tenfold. Um, what she is doing right now is she is looking at for bucks that we have two years of data so you got to have the exact same buck in year one and year two and then we're going in different time frames like a one week time frame or a two week time frame to speak to this pattern of during a particular time of year is a buck going to be in this area or is he going to be five miles down the road and so she is going through now and going week by week or two week by two week period and calculating the distance of the, the center of the home range for that one or two week period of time. And they go into that same time frame one year later and calculating that distance to see how reliable it can be when you saw a buck in the last two weeks of October. What's your chances of? him being in that same area assuming he's alive the following year i'll so, be excited to see that data because that, that there are a lot months. of hunters yeah cool sorry were you going to say something chris i, I just said ch check with us in a few months and we'll get that answer for you excellent one yeah, thing i wanted to point out about the last results you shared is that there's higher fidelity during the rut so contrary to popular belief a buck is repeating. I believe. Am I misquoting there? Were you were you saying that earlier? Oh, I, I was saying during the rut. If we're going to call a uh, a particular site, you know, wh whatever you're defining as the site of fidelity, mm -hmm. uh, there would be less fidelity less, okay. during the rut because he's I moving see. a wider range on the landscape. Right, right. His net displacements further. Yes, that's correct. Yes. All right. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I was I was wondering, and I, and I know this is another thing that's hard to quantify, but are you seeing correlations between the choices a buck is making, betting, and any particular time of year? So for me, it it begs the question: Is a buck choosing to bed near doe bedding at a higher frequency? during the rut and may that be why he is experiencing less fidelity why he's having a greater net displacement because he's choosing to hit multiple areas that are doe bedding areas um part part of that statement i completely agree with part of it not so much um okay. I, I would not call it that the buck is showing less fidelity because he's going to different uh doe bedding areas specifically a doe bedding area i think the buck is just navigating the landscape period whether 
he is going to encounter a doe that is about to be or in estrus he may encounter her on a food plot i mean not just in her bedding area she may be 800 yards from her bedding area eating white oak acorns when they're you know chris when they're doing like they're supposed to and falling at the right time <laughs> but um so he 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 is just covering ground you know with nose in the air trying to determine is is a doe and estrus awesome thank you so we are kind of in that we're in that rut time frame but before we move further into the year i, I wanted to ask as far as um when bucks are making rubs and scrapes and things like that when when do you see that activity ramp up um that pre-rut okay. that, that, that is pre-rut and you know and there's a lot of ways you can define is that the the entire month preceding the peak of the rut uh or is that just you know some people say the pre-rut is just the two weeks before the peak of the rut but you know i would say that month before and maybe even five to six weeks before is essentially that is when the the bucks are working on their social network you know dominance mm -hmm. hierarchy social network they're putting their scent out there they're knowing where other bucks are at they're putting their calling card out there and then all of that the, the frequency of all that behavior declines during the rut because plain and simple they're they're occupied by the real thing now I mean, they're they're looking for does That's what true. um age class of deer and what time of day do they make the majority of sign let's say scrapes uh unfortunately uh most of it is done a, a majority i don't know about most a, a majority is going to be done at night the the instances where it, either hunter observation or trail camera that you see them making scrapes is going to be younger age bucks during the daytime and when you get to that three and a half and especially four and a half plus rare rare for him to to be out there during daylight hours making a scrape it still happens and every year people are successful and kill them but if you were to truly quantify as as we did a whole bunch of scrapes and classify the age class of the bucks doing it um the young bucks will do it all bucks are doing it more at night the ones that are doing it during the day are young and there's very few four and a half plus bucks doing it during hunting hours i'm trying Chris, to think of, i'm trying to think of how i want to ask this i need jacob's <laughs> mind to be in mind so i can throw out all of his nice words um <laughs> how are you how are you going about figuring that out and, and i'll tell you my experience so if we're talking about scraping here in the midwest at the end of october and into november and even into december uh what i would call a rut scrape a, a testosterone um scrape if you will um are you <clears throat> referring to that or are you talking about scrapes that happen all time during the year uh all times of the year um i i can't speak to all times during the year as rare as that would be um we did this study uh, we, we actually had some other study objectives, but we were able to collect this data as well. So we started monitoring, I can't remember the number, it, it, was, a, it was a lot of scrapes and a lot of cameras and a lot of data. Uh, but we were looking at them, say, September, October. So for us, well before the pre-rut, you know, the behavior, sure. all during pre-rut, all during peak rut, all during post-rut. So over greater than a four month period, we monitored. And to your point, some of these scrapes, when we were going out and finding scrapes, identifying it, yeah, we're gonna include it in the study, let's put a camera up. Some of them, they got visited one time again and there, a deer never returned. Yeah. 
And then some of these were these prime time scrapes that, you know, a lot of deer were hitting. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting talking to you guys in the South. Things just seem to be way more spread out when it comes to betting, when it comes to sign in general. And um, it's, it's very difficult to nail those suckers down. I, I feel like once you get where it's colder and you add terrain, as uh, you know, in my experience, and this would be anecdotal, of course, but in my experience, the steeper the terrain, the more consistent the betting sites are. And then you're able to narrow down certain scrapes where they actually visit them, like mature, the biggest bucks in the area, visit them in daylight a lot. Um, it's it's actually quite unreal. It's it's actually some it's kind of the name of my game is targeting scrapes, so that's why I'm so inquisitive about this. So um, I appreciate it though. And um, and to, I will to follow further, up that. So I was just to further Chris's point here when when we're referring to a scrape, they're not always scraping, but a lot of times they're hitting the licking branches. That's yeah, what they're hitting. It, it's almost um, never pawing the ground. They're always working that yeah. licking branch. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, uh, I, I don't even really know how to get at this analytically. Uh, I think you'd have to do a new study to really yeah. figure this out. But um, I mean, I have noticed the places like you're referring to. And the question I always ask myself down here, why here? You know, what, what is so special? And, and I know I've talked to a lot of other deer biologists that have seen this as well. And uh, there's never really a definitive answer. But, you know, we haven't done a, a study to really try to examine this because it's kind of hard to conduct the study. But one thing several of us kind of arrive at is, you know, sometimes, well, is it the type of tree? Is it because of the juxtaposition of doe bedding? You know, what makes this, you know, just that really big scrape that we're always visiting? And the one thing we always arrive at is uh, a, a corridor. It may not be anything that is really, really special about this tree or this spot or even anything right around here. But in general, there are a lot of deer moving through this area, and that is just an ideal scrape. If you're going to have a scrape, then that's the spot you're going to have it. That's how it always sets up for me. They're they're mm -hmm. basically, you know, you could say pressure, terrain, cover, however you want. They're basically kind of squeezed or, you know, favor an area, and there's a good amount of deer that are traveling generally from bed, bed to food, and, and it's pretty significantly close to bed um and they all walk by there and that's this is where we, and i don't mean to go too off topic here but this is where me and josh scream at people all the time for trusting trail cams too much because we we see these deer walking by you know 60 yards behind some dumb two-year-old who set the camera off and he's not even trying he, he already knows what's going on he just happens to be in the background, but they're there almost every day in that vicinity. So that's just kind of why the scrape exists. And it's actually interesting when we find those scrapes, you know, the grounds recess, it's got broken licking branches. It, they're very easy to pick out when you know what you're looking for. So, and they're not there because a deer, you know, decided to go somewhere and make a scrape. They're just in a heav heavily trafficked area. Yeah. Yeah. I completely buy into that. And I, I, I do want to add that I don't necessarily say, um, you know, there's 20 or 50 deer moving through. It could be two deer, but they go through there all the time. So yeah. anyway. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I pulled some cards today and uh, I had a cam placed on an area that I identified that looked like they were frequently using some licking branches. And I had... Too small, what I would call like two year olds and some does actually hitting the licking branches. Uh, what is today? We're in we're in August right now. Um, back in early July, they were you know hitting the licking branches and stuff, and then throughout. I mean, up until like the day before, like yesterday, I had a video of one just hitting the licker branch, getting his face in it and stuff. So, but those. Those scrapes are very interesting. They seem to have a high fidelity, 
And a lot of times it's due to concentrated travel and, and also like a lot of times they're correlated. They're like close to bedding areas. Yeah. You should come out with a Turkey season only graphic. That would be pretty insane to look at, look at that kind especially in the South, what that kind of pressure does to the deer and where the heck they go. That's, that's not a bad thought. That'd be interesting. How does turkey hunting impact? Yeah, deer movements. Yeah. Be interesting. I always wonder. Yeah. I feel like the theory behind those scrapes being in high traffic areas is that they're information hubs. They're a place for deer to gather yeah. information. How do yeah. they do that? Scent. And it seems yep. like that's that's the reason they get they get targeted so much by deer and especially just the local area if they can smell from downwind. But yep. I wanted to touch on another metric of fidelity, just to make it super clear. We've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but how often do you see a deer using the same bedding area or the same bed, we'll say? Maybe those are two different uh, percentages from day to day. Does that change depending on the time of the season? Um, unfor you know, I'm afraid to, to give this number. <laughs> That's okay. But That's okay. Can't remember them off the top of my head, but I will say this, and this is a little bit self-serving here. Um, but we did a podcast devoted just to the betting, and we put it on YouTube with Luke Resop, and so he has all of those slides and the bar charts where he is going through exactly those numbers. There, is this on the uh, MSU Deer Labs channel. Yes, if okay. you go to the MSU Deer Labs uh, YouTube channel and then the okay. Deer University podcast there, it, it'll be there. So, And that was done, I believe, in February of this year. Oh, cool. But it spells it out okay. perfectly everything we did. Okay. Well, but there were a lot of beds in general. Uh, there were a lot of bed sites that were used once or twice and never again. Uh, but there were instances where there was a great deal of fidelity. But if you just looked at what is the probability of a bed site being used over and over and over again, it was really, really low. But there were a few beds that bucks would use numerous times. Makes sense. So you can't ever say never. They're never going to use the same bed. They will. <coughs> But they don't always use the same bed either. There's just a lot of diversity. And when you're when you're saying that, you're referring to a season wide basis or a day to day basis. Uh, the way Luke analyzed those data, he broke it up into he did he did a hunting season wide. So for us, that would be October one to January thirty first, whole hunting season, and then he broke them into two week rut categories. Okay. All throughout the rut. I'm curious if there is a specific, no, I know you guys did a little bit on cover. I'm curious if there's a specific type of cover that, and as we've seen, uh, deer are disposed to spend more of their daylight time bedded. We saw through that graphic on their behaviors during the day. Is there a specific cover that deer are more disposed to bed within? and therefore spend more daylight time with it. What is specific about the vegetation is that it is a vegetation that conceals a buck. It does not matter if it is woody stems. It does not matter if it is palmetto. It does not matter if it is blackberry. It does not matter if it's grass or switchgrass. The what was really important is that we called it screening cover, but it's concealment cover. <laughs> and yeah, let's see what figure that is. It's towards the end, 25. I believe. 25 has habitat selection. I think it's also interesting to note that the deer are spending less daylight time in areas where the hunter habitat selection is high. They're spending more time at night. Now, they may need to spend time in these areas, it looks like, from the data. But it looks like they're spending more daylight time in areas that the hunter, habit, the hunter habitat selection is lower. So are you basically saying where you can't get in a tree? 
Um, well, I guess the take home there for, for us is that let's look at where hunters hunt most often. Down here, they hunt on food plots most often. And so one of the easiest ways that you can alert deer to your presence and have a hunting pressure effect uh, as, as quick as possible is that deer are attracted to food, just like we are, of course, and then you're hunting on the food and then you're gonna constantly be disturbing them and not just with the gunshot or the bow shot, it's entry into the stand, exiting the stand at dark and doing that over and over again. Deer know that uh, they do not need to go to food plots during daylight hours. And one thing that N Natasha I spoke about earlier, when she basically did that type of analysis you're looking at, but she did it over time. And what she demonstrated was that at the beginning of our deer season here, and, and even right before the deer season, she was calculating the time at, when, at which bucks were entering food plots. So completely exposing themselves, entering food plots. During archery season, the average time of food plot entry was about an hour before sunset. You had about an hour of legal shooting light during bow season and the further and further and further now gun season and then into gun season, it completely shifted from the average food plot entry time went from an hour before sunset to an hour after sunset, perfectly aligning with hunting pressure throughout deer season. Man. And so what you got to do there is you got to hunt those food plots, right? You know, hunt the trail to the plot hunt in the woods you know just strategies like that don't let the deer pattern you mm -hmm. really really hits on <clears throat> uh, a lot of people are big on access and we are too like really honing in your access to not alert the buck uh and then kind of our particular style of hunting mobile hunting kind of moving around changing up whether it be your, your entry routes or just, you know, setting different areas, not repetitively hunting a specific tree or a specific spot um, just to help increase your odds of, of catching a buck in daylight and getting an opportunity at them. I feel like that really kind of hits on that well. Sure. Did we want to touch Take on the screen cover a little bit? The screen cover? Yeah, we were. What we did were it find a screen cover? Yeah, we were kind of talking about that a little bit, and then we minorly shifted. Go for it, Chris. Uh, oh, I was just interested that it kind of sounds like it correlates with our podcast with Alan Summerford when he talked about how all the the browse that they get in and bed in, feed in, etc., can be belly height or well over their head, and for whatever reason, they feel extremely secure in it even though oftentimes they don't have a sight advantage um mm -hmm. he said he he calls a lot of deer in and stuff like that which is very interesting but you get into the the open timber and then the food plots and everything and it's freak out mode 2000 basically they're very edgy yeah yeah uh, what 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 we found is uh that that the type of because someone may ask you know do i need to look for a wet area for this particular type of cover or an upland area with this particular type of cover what we found is the type of vegetation really did not matter it was just is it uh is it an area that will conceal the buck visual screening that was the single most unifying part of all the bedding cover that's super interesting. Man. It, thinking, huh? yeah. One thing I want to point out too, is this an area where the majority of hunting season you have rifles and guns rather than bows? <laughs> yeah. So archery season is going to be roughly five to six. Archery only is going to be roughly five to six weeks. 
Uh, and then this is a typical Southern hunting environment where mid November, the rifles come out and they don't go up until the end of January. So for reference in the area I hunt, it's five months of archery rather than five to six weeks of archery. Yeah. And it is nine days of gun. About and the, the pressure in that nine days completely eclipses the bow kill over and over. But yeah. the bow hunter effort is extremely high. So that maybe the repercussions of that pressure is experienced the same during the bow season because of the duration and of the pressure. But the damage to the deer herd is mostly done during gun season where I'm at where you have an influx of hunters, but it's only happening for nine days. Um, so it's really interesting because the, the deer change their behavior greatly due to bow pressure, especially moving towards the rut. Uh, but they change their numbers, we'll say, <laughs> and they change their behavior even further greatly during gun season, which kind of gives me a little bit of segue. We're talking about uh, this cover and we're talking about time of year and things like that. I'm wondering if the deer are shifting their beds or their preferred daylight movement in the late season or post maybe a lot of that pressure coming in. Are you seeing any significant shifts other than adjusting to pressure? Are you seeing a habitat type shift due to maybe post rut or things like that? Uh, not yet, but very good question. And we are looking into that. So our, our first examination of quantifying the bedding was, was just really about number. Mm. You know, how many times are they doing this? How many times they're, they're doing that? L literally our next step with the bedding is getting more to what are the, as best we can tell, uh, keep this in mind too. Those, those bucks had collars on them in 2017 and 2018 and now it's 2024. So even going back to where a buck's bed was, that, that was six years ago. So the mm -hmm. vegetation can be completely different. So, but we are going to be looking at things that, um, that, that we think still describe the, the habitat characteristics as well as topography. Uh, we're even going to be adding in, and this is where, thank goodness you got a mathematician. We're also going to be adding in, um, how does that change relative to prevailing wind? Excellent. This site with this wind, this site with that wind. Are you, I'm, I'm curious, and I know we're, we're getting into the future here, but are you collaring does to observe doe and buck interaction in the study as well? Uh, we certainly over the years have collared some does for various projects but but nothing in the amount that we are now so yeah we do have some doe data but it's like three or four or five from this area this part of mississippi and this part of mississippi but we do not have a collection of 20 30 40 50 pollard does from this area unfortunately that's okay when i win the lottery next week i'm gonna fly you guys up and we'll get you all the deer we can <laughs> i'm gonna hold you to that yeah no honestly this is something that is it's just so intriguing to me like i would absolutely i mean it would be a thrill for me to be a part of a, a study such as this unfortunately being in wisconsin i <laughs> wouldn't be able to partake in an msu deer lab study at least where you guys are at um but man if i had resources and i had time to devote to something like this this is just as chris and josh definitely know this is exactly up my alley yeah, it's, it's always fun looking at the data and the analytics and like, what does it say? How does this differ compared to like what I've seen or how is it the same as far as like, you know, the general kind of your big buck killers, like what are they saying? Uh, what are they seeing? Um, so this is going to be really good to go back to because we've talked about a lot of like correlation between what the data has shown and like what we have experienced. And I, I think when we get into the episodes later on, I think it's going to be important for us, um, myself, Jacob and Chris to kind of talk about and hit on how a lot of times these very successful hunters are looking for very specific, um, very, I guess, 
if I can talk very specific like circumstances um, when when they're targeting these deer. So like for example, our our buddy Jake Bush, who we had on earlier, when a lot of times when he's killing some of these bigger deer early season, it's it's under a very specific circumstance. He likes to hunt early season, uh, kind of he'll target like these hub scrapes, but he is, you know, scouting could be a hundred different ones and he finds one that has the situation that he's looking for and has like the class of buck that he's looking for. Um, and, and this, you know, happens with other hunters. We, we talked about earlier, like Dan Infault when he's bed hunting, right? The, the area in which he is successful at this, right? A lot of times these bucks only have specific areas that they can bed. Pressure is pushing them into very specific locations. So the fidelity might be higher compared to other areas. So, just going further, I think it's going to be very helpful for us to kind of pick those little tidbits out when we're going with a lot of the anecdotal stuff. Yeah. So do you have any studies that have maybe dispelled big hunting myths of any kinds? Well, that's a smile. We like this smile. <laughs> Um, I, I actually jotted a little something down here. I was going to put y'all on the spot Ooh. about. Perfect. So when I uh, recorded with uh, the Southern Outdoorsman guys, they were asking more. And, and a lot of people have asked this over, over the years is uh, you'll see in that publication, we did a deer movement relative to moon phase. And, and moon phase, just new moon, full moon, et cetera. And, uh, and there are a lot of people that have a belief on, on just, you know, the effects of the full moon or not. I, I think I'm very biased. I think the graphic we provided there ought to be pretty self uh, obvious and evident that there's really no movement relationship with the moon. But the feedback we kept getting was that it's not just the moon phase, but it's also the position. And so Boom. is it moon overhead? Is it moon underfoot and, and all that? So we are in the process now of analyzing the data relative to these different moon categories relative to the moon position and its phase. So the question that I have for y'all is what would constitute there being a positive moon effect or not? And let me help you answer that. Most people, including me, would say if such and such environmental condition happened and the deer were moving that day, man, the deer were really moving that day, for me, that would mean. I went to I went to the stand or I went to hunt the way I always do, and I saw a bunch of deer. I either saw a bunch of deer or I saw a bunch of bucks, but I obviously could see and had the sense that deer were moving. So I would say, um, if I related that to an environmental condition, I might think that the environment caused you know there to be greater movement. <clears throat> now, one thing that we cannot do with the GPS collar data is we can no way say that you would have seen that buck this particular day or not. We don't know where all the hunters are. We're not tallying up who saw what. All we have is we know when that buck was bedded. We know when that buck was on his feet. And we know from time one to time two how far he moved. So what would it take given those metrics for you all to say hey there's something to this moon effect a a mature buck uh in my opinion four and a half or older moving significantly further from his bed for me that's just my opinion so and then then you get into data significance so what you may consider significant chris might not be exactly what the data considers significant. So there's, they, they'll, they'll, say, they'll quantify what, what I, I would go by their definition, honestly, because a, a significance will be relative to how much a buck 
typically travels. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, let's say he's 50 yards from his bed, you know, a half hour before dark or right at dark, generally every day or however you come up with that. And then today we had a, you know, a perfectly timed red moon. And now he's 125 yards from his bed at the same time. I, I guess I should have yeah. spelled that out a little better. It, it'll be your deviation from the average. It'll be. I think is how yeah. Josh, I'm, I'm totally going to, I'm going to add to Chris's point, which is why I'm skipping past you here. I see that you're, you're being polite His finger there. Going um, crazy. Over <laughs> right. So, um, I will say earlier movement on top of that, I will say movement that is not only further or, but also earlier, something that a deer does that gives me a greater chance of catching it in daylight. Okay, that's yeah. a very good response, Josh. I I'm gonna stolen yours. I I completely was... agree with that, Jacob. I think that is very very reasonable to say that. So the buck is on his feet sooner than baseline, and 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 uh, additionally moved further than baseline average during daylight hours. So but, I'm I'm gonna just add a caveat there. So. Because I've dove into this past couple of years, the, the the people that really harp on the moon and really pay attention to it say total distance does not change. It is the time. Like they may move on their feet a little bit sooner. Therefore, they may get to a location where you can kill them in daylight hours. Um, at least that's what I've heard by the owner of the Red Moon Guide. That's his big thing it's it's not so much distance like total distance difference it's you have to be in the right location but it's just a, a little nudge to get up a little sooner and start that movement pattern um and I, I feel like that's fairly accurate and then typically it's with the moon position lining up with those uh, dusk and dawn times when they are naturally up and walking more often during daylight hours so sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you there if if a deer gets up earlier and starts walking sooner, then we could probably agree that he's going to make it a further distance then. No, I'm, his total distance isn't changing. He's just moving sooner. Okay. Do, do you see where I'm going with this line of questions here? Is what, what I'm trying to get insight on from you guys is this is not going to be for, for, those of you that are statistics gurus, this is not going to be a statistical significance answer because we have so much data that we could find statistical significance fairly easy if there's any deviation from baseline. What I want to know is what is a meaningful difference for you to go, huh, there's really something. So if we're going to deal with just the timing, Josh, is it what if we and i'm making this up i don't know the answer but uh if we were to show that heck yeah man on this red moon day th they do they're moving sooner a whole five minutes sooner i would say a red moon guy yeah right i, I would say um so, so honestly my gripe with a lot of these moon phase charts and stuff are always like on a red moon or on a full moon and it is always the full moon closest to peak red or always the red moon closest to peak red and it's like yeah they're going to be at this point traveling exponentially more than the last day every single day regardless of the moon phase so yeah if you go out on this this day you're going to see an uptick in travel than last week but I'm not an expert on it at all. So I won't I won't say that's what's actually going on because it is yet to be shown, um, I, I guess, in the way that we're discussing now. But if I were to answer your question, I would say 30 minutes I would consider myself as a hunter. Like, as you said, your, your sample size is so high, you will find a lot of, you know, significant data. You will find significant differences, um, statistically significant. But I would say as a hunter, 30 minutes is extremely significant in my mind. Yeah. Now, now 10 to 15 minutes, 
probably six times last season was the difference between me getting a shot on a deer. Thankfully I didn't actually, cause it was smaller than what I ended up getting in the end, but it was the difference between me getting one and not on, on many, many hunts in the early season. So if, if you were to identify data that was 30 minutes earlier, I would consider that as every hunter out there would say it's extremely significant. And then as far as movement goes, I would say, in my opinion, 50 yards is extremely significant. Um, but in the, and that's in the area I hunt. But I would say for most people, more along the lines of 80 to 100 yards would be extremely significant. But that's kind of the envelope I'm pushing where 50 yards makes all the difference in the world. And I would say not many people are are quite at the point where they're saying, I'm absolutely within 60 yards of this deer's bed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that is very conservative. What the the time and distance you provided um, is is very conservative based on feedback I've gotten before. But we also have to put something in context here. Y'all aren't the typical hunter. I think that's typically lashing out to me and what what you're describing is getting an edge on a particular buck and having a shot and i don't know if y'all represent five percent of hunters that feel this way or 55 percent of hunters but then there's another group that are just going to say is today and, and y'all know this is today a good day to hunt or not because quote the deer are going to be moving it was just one of the deer were moving and see that that's a different that's a different context oh absolutely yeah. yeah if it's just deer moving like most people that pay attention to the moon and stuff for them for the most part there's a couple that will disagree but the vast majority of them will say weather trumps moon like no matter what um now i have heard um oh i'm blanking on his name uh but the owner of the red moon guide um adam and he, he said that too adam hayes yes i mean he said for the most part weather will trump it but he has seen instances where he went based off his moon data and it even it was a quote unquote terrible weather day and the buck he was after did come out where he was anticipating it so uh but i believe most people feel that that weather will trump it no matter what for me the the data that you're about to analyze dr strickland is the most valuable as far as uh moon position because as many, many, many people in my shoes where they have limited time to hunt and they have, you know, certain days that they're available, my major decision is when should I be in the tree, not if I should be in the tree. Because hmm. if I can hunt, I will, and I will pick the situation that fits best for it um, with a whole bunch of factors in mind, of location and, and wind direction and weather and all those things. But if you find it, and I, according to my criteria, statistically significant. So we'll say like, if if you find in your data that with this moon positioning, a deer is likely to start moving immediately after or 30 minutes earlier or a hundred yards further, that will change how I set up on that day and when I decide to set up that day. So I think a lot of people are in the position where they don't, they're not like, oh, I have 300 days I could hunt let's just pick the best of those 300 days. I think a lot of people, some of them are in that boat from a perspective of vacation, but by the time you put in vacation, usually you have no idea what the date is going to be or what the weather is going to be. But I think a lot of people are in the sh shoes of, okay, I have this day that I can hunt. How am I going to hunt it? And how might my selection change where I might back off of an area? Like we said, uh, sometimes it's, it's hard to predict where a deer is bedded and when it's bedded there. I might back off of an area where I know there's three beds about 50 yards apart, right? And those trails eventually come to a pinch that's gonna meet at a scrape. And that's a high traffic area. Now, if I think that deer is gonna travel 50 yards further or 100 yards further in daylight because of the data that you've captured in this upcoming study, I'm probably gonna inch closer to that scrape because now I can cover three beds knowing that that deer may travel further. But if I don't think that deer is gonna move that for much further, I'm going to go with the one that I think is the most likely scenario. That is very well reasoned. Yeah. Um, 
so what we're hoping to do, and, and I wasn't doing that to quote really challenge you or to put you on the spot, but th those are kind of some of the decisions we have to make of sure. how do you the narrative and yeah. the story. Is it effective or is it not? Well, it's hard because, because to me, it really depends on the way we're going to present the data is here's what we found. And you get to decide as a hunter if you think that is if we found any change at all, is that change is 15 minutes earlier or is another 50 yards? Is that worth it to you to say this is a better day for my hunting situation? That That's really all we can hope to do there. Yeah, that's that's excellent. So, yeah. Go oh, ahead, Chris. Sorry. Yep. Um, you got it. Go ahead. How would you strategize your hunts based off the studies you've done? Well, so far, it has nothing to do with moon. <laughs> um, you said it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of the most, well, let, let me start with, with the basics. Uh, unless we find something that supersedes this, I, I don't think we do, but I'm always going to remain open-minded. Um, nothing supersedes sun up and sundown. Uh, nothing supersedes the greater movement response we see during the rut. Now, what I have really enjoyed looking at, and again, this is our environment, so I cannot say this translates to Ohio or Wisconsin, sure. but in where we're at and what we see with these affinity to food plots. I mean, deer are visiting food plots. There, there's no question about it. Uh, when they visit, you know, it all depends on hunting pressure. Uh, Natasha, who again, I referred to earlier, she ran a really neat analysis looking at the frequency of visits to food plots. And what she found is that throughout the year, September to October, and really for us, our cool season food plots, they're really being planted and really starting to germinate and grow October and then November. But when deer really started bucks, excuse me, when bucks really started hitting the plots more often was during uh, was during the rut. And so you might be thinking, now, now wait a minute, you know, bucks, I, I can't imagine them spending a whole bunch of time on food plots during the rut. They're so, it's supposed to be breeding season. But what she found is that there was a whole bunch of visits to food plots as much or even more so than during the post rut. Now remember the post rut, that's when the bucks are supposed to be focusing on the food and regenerating their body. Well, the, the, the devil was in the details there. The bucks were going as often or more often to those food plots during the peak of the rut, but the duration of time which they stayed there was much less than during the post rut. So when you when you broke it down to how long and their behavior while they were on the plot, the bucks were visiting the plot to look for estrus does. Yep. They're running yep. the circuit. They are looking for breeding opportunities. In the post rut, they are visiting the plots and actually eating. So all that to say to the question, is when you look, when we put together some of these videos and over a year, and we find that these uh, food plots and a really good one is going to be three to five acres. Really good one. That's where we found that more often that is where the bucks were going to. They are really anchors on the landscape. And so just me just thinking about what are my high, highest probability areas to be during the rut, it may not be sitting on a plot it may be finding a corridor that is linking two or three plots together. So looking at the landscape and I got three food plots, what do I think is the habitat corridor that would be linking that to where a buck could go scent check this plot and then go scent check another plot? That, that is, that's probably the biggest thing that's, that's changed with me from these data. All right. That's, that's awesome. That's 
I think that's a great overview of of the motivations of a deer. I mean, we often call it in, in hunting hubs, like just a centralized area of activity. And I think you make a really good point about deer moving to gain information during the rut on does. And then you're putting yourself between two areas of the highest likelihood that they'll end up. And, yeah. and you're maybe catching travel from two different areas simultaneously because of it. And you have a real advantage if you are in a landscape where corridors are very defined. Yeah. So if you are in an open landscape with corridors that are linking up these food plots, you got a really, really big advantage. If you're like in most of the Southeast where it's forest land and there are those little holes in the forest, you know, every couple hundred acres and there's a food plot, it's more difficult to concentrate deer. And you don't even have topography in a lot of these places. It's just flat land and it's forest. So it, it's hard to concentrate them in in my mind. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think we're kind of fortunate in like our areas where you get some, especially in areas with a lot of topography, you can really define those those locations that just kind of funnel movement i feel like yeah. most people will refer to them as like rut funnels um around here um that's why I, that's why you hear a lot of people talk about them in the midwest right right makes perfect sense to me mm -hmm. um fellas do you have any other questions for dr strickland i think i'm i'm satisfied with this one i just want to make this Oh, go ahead. I just want to make the point that you have some excellent conclusions at the end of this uh, study here that everyone should read. And I don't want to touch on it too much because I want to point them to your resources and actually have them go look at those publications because it's much more valuable than, than just sharing a graphic, all the explanations behind it. But I think we've done a good job touching on comprehensively how deer bed in relation to time of year and how they move and what their motivations are and then it is at least invited the listener to think a little bit behind some of the trends they've seen in hunting and why those might be because in all honesty there's a lot of people that get we'll call it triggered that's probably not the best terminology but triggered when these <laughs> studies come out because they're like my anecdotal data is not lining up well there's a lot of reason for our habits dodging deer habits and and uh, I just think that we've done a great job of explaining potentially some reasoning behind it too. I love it. Yep. So for our listeners, we'll post the link. Uh, we'll post the um, research article. That way it's nice and easy to find. Um, but yeah, definitely look on the website, read over the study. There's lots of good information as well as some of the other studies. If you haven't looked over those, there's lots of good tidbits that you can utilize and, and, really help your skill set as a whitetail hunter i believe uh, but with that this has been the whitetail apprentice series and i have been your host josh luck i was co-hosted by christopher leppert jacob Sklinner, and we were joined by the very wonderful dr bronson strickland dr strickland thank you very much for your time thank you absolutely anytime <laughs>